Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you all again. Um, my name is Shalina. I'm the Northwest Business Editor at the Business Desk. And welcome to um, our session, which is looking at how tech for good can change our lives for the better. Post pandemic recovery is being framed around a build back better motto. Tech for good already has a growing momentum, with acting as an umbrella term for using technology to deliver better services, connecting communities, and addressing social, environmental, and economic challenges. So how do we use technology to improve our communities and society for the benefit of all? To start off this session, um, we have our, our guest speaker, Florian Marcus, who is Digital Transformation Advisor at E-Estonia Briefing Center. And um, welcome, Florian. Hi there, thank you very much for having hi, me. Hi. So uh, Florian uh, will share his insights into Estonia's digital development with global political decision makers and business leaders to help them with the digitalization journeys. He holds two masters in the field of political studies and also serves as a member of the UNFDP's roster of, of experts on e-government. Right, uh, Florian, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with you now to tell us the kind of work that you're doing in Estonia. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, uh, so greetings uh, mostly to up north, I guess, in the UK. Um, so as a digital transformation advisor at the Briefing Centre, I try to explain to the rest of the world what's going on in, in, in the area of digitalization in Estonia. And so I think that's a good place to start. Um, right now in Estonia, we have 99% of government services accessible online. Uh, the only two things that you cannot do online are uh, getting married and getting divorced. Uh, that is doable on paper and it's also quite fast, uh, but still there's a sort of, uh, you know, uh, you know, you have a sort of thinking period of a month beforehand. Um, everything else is online. So you can create a business online, a limited liability company in 20 minutes yourself. Uh, you can buy or sell a house online. Uh, you can pay your taxes in three minutes. 98.7% of people do that. You can vote online in elections, local, national, for the European Parliament as well, though that's not so relevant for you guys anymore. So there are all these different things that you can do online. And what we've seen is that as a result, society has become a lot more resilient. Um, when uh, COVID struck and you know all the schools had to move to online teaching, they were prepared for that because we've had an online school system, a sort of the school management system, entering grades, um, handing out homework, test results, and so on. So these things have been online since the early 2000s. And as a result, switching to the online world for Estonian schools was comparably straightforward. Um, also, uh, some people, uh, especially in the tourist sector, had to be laid off. And uh, we, um, you know, we saw uh, immediately that some people that were laid off, they created new companies. Why? Because it takes 20 minutes. So the whole debureaucratization has really helped Estonians stay nimble and stay on their, uh, stay on their toes uh, during these very trying times for, uh, for many people around the world. But I do also want to talk a bit about uh, the future plans and what we're working on these days, maybe not so much uh, the past. Um, so these days we are working primarily in, in two fields. The first is what we call proactive government services. The idea behind that is very, very simple. I'll give you um, a straightforward example. If we think about the uh, the event of childbirth, what's been happening for uh, for the last twenty years in Estonia is that uh, a doctor would you know register the birth of the child, uh, give um, the baby a sort of citizen identity number, and connect that identity number with the two identity numbers of the uh, parents because they are the legal guardians. And so at that point, technically, the government knows uh, through the various channels. Number one, there is a new baby. Number two, these are the parents. Um, and then the parents started asking a couple of years ago, if the government knows both of these things, why do we still have to apply for child benefit payments? You know, why don't we just get a notification in the state portal that says, congratulations on the birth of your child, to which bank account do we send the money? You know, and the, the question is a fair one. The government knows everything it needs to know to provide that service to me. And so this is where we see a change in the self-understanding of government. No longer do we see citizens as data providers, but ourselves as service providers. And I think that this is a change that uh, that many countries will hopefully make uh, over, the, over the coming years. So we're, we're very optimistic. And of course, Estonia is more than happy to help uh, both local communities uh, and, and national governments uh, with these kinds of uh, transformation projects. So what I just described, the, the proactive child benefit payments, 
Um, this service has been implemented two years ago. This can also, we can, we can think about these proactive services on, on very different scales. Something that we are implementing right now, which will hopefully be, as so it's in the piloting stage, it will hopefully be brought online uh, next year, is um, uh, so the, the proactive school registration. There's a very simple point here. If the government knows um, a child is born, it knows the address of the parents, and it knows just as a legal parameter that every child must attend primary school. And we can connect these three points, make a trigger, make a new notification in the portal uh, that says, congratulations on the birth of your child once again. Um, here are the three closest primary schools to your location. Uh, you can choose one of those three schools, and we will reserve a place for your child at that school six years into the future when your kid is supposed to start going to school in Estonia. And as a result of that, um, every single school, all the municipalities uh, as well, of course, uh, but all the different schools would get a notification that says, hey, we know how many classrooms you have right now. We know how many teachers you employ. Uh, we, uh, we know how many students study at your school. That's state information. That's very basic stuff. Uh, the, the, the UK government knows that stuff as well. So, but based on our calculations, we know that you will have at your school in six years, 200 more students than you have today. As a result of that calculation, we know you will need 10 new classrooms and 30 new teachers, particularly physics and biology teachers. We're already running short on those today, so we can start creating special incentives for people to, to study to become uh, physics and biology teachers. Um, the schools can start with the building permit applications and so on. Uh, we can start thinking about the funding, uh, you know, which often in most countries comes uh, from the local, regional and national level uh, to certain degrees. Um, so we can start with all of these different things today so that the resources are ready in six years when they are needed. And this is very, very important. This has nothing to do with science fiction. This is all based on data that most countries have today. It's just that in most instances, uh, the different government authorities are not allowed to talk to each other uh, for privacy reasons and so on. In Estonia, we have fixed that, but uh, how we have done this uh, is probably a, a task for another time. Um, maybe one last thing. I mentioned there are two things that we focus on uh, these days. The first one is the proactive service stuff. The second is artificial intelligence. And now this is obviously one of the buzzwords. Um, some of the hype is justified, some is not. Uh, we today have around uh, 50 AI use cases uh, in use in the public sector. Some of them are very, very basic that you can implement tomorrow. So for example, uh, in the Estonian parliament, we have a voice recognition tool uh, that takes all the minutes uh, of all the sessions of parliament uh, and makes them accessible online. Um, some more complex stuff would be uh, in the Estonian job agency, we have an algorithm that connects unemployed people uh, with job vacancies. Uh, and we've already seen a boost in two ways. First of all, a higher connection rate in the first place. So just finding the right jobs for the right people. And then also uh, we saw that the average time that those people would spend with their new jobs, that that has increased as well. So I think that those are two very important metrics uh, when we look at that, uh, that topic. Um, what the Estonian government is working on these days is strengthening the voice assistance that we have on our phones already today. Um, if we think about it, already today we can book uh, plane tickets with Siri or Google or Alexa uh, because there's contextualization going on. You know, I can say, book me tickets to Thailand next month, maximum a thousand euros, and then it's going to sort that out for me. What we want to do is connect several more data sources. Uh, primarily um, publicly accessible information from the public sector. So for example, foreign ministry website information about COVID travel restrictions, and also privately accessible uh, public sector information, for example, your passport details. And so what we would like uh, to happen is, um, instead of just booking the tickets for you, is that if you ask the voice assistant for tickets uh, to Thailand, that it will say, yeah, I found those tickets, they're within your budget range and everything. Um, but by the way, I know that in order to travel to Thailand, you do not need uh, you know, a, a visa or anything, but you do need a passport that is valid for three more months. Now, I know for a fact that your passport expires next week. So why don't we renew your passport today so that you can travel safely to Thailand and back uh, next month? And um, the, the main focus here really is the strengthened 
um, contextualization of data. Um, any human with a sort of sound understanding of life will know that flying to a different country is not just about the flight. It's about getting through security uh, in that other country. So um, just booking flight tickets is an unsuccessful operation, to say the least. And so this is where there is a lot of work to do. Um, also in the in the area of privacy and and data protection, uh, there are some question marks. You know how we can sort this out. Um, but if you are worried about uh, you know privacy and data protection uh, in all of these different contexts, um, I I can I can assure you that you know we're taking good care of that stuff. In Estonia, we have sadly a, a very unique program uh, that doesn't exist like that in any other country in the world. It's called the data tracker. And in the data tracker, I can see almost every single time uh, which government authority looked at what part of my data, when and why. And if we if we feel that uh, that there have been any transgressions potentially, uh, then we can uh, get in touch with the data protection inspectorate and they will start an investigation. So um, uh, it's what we call the little brother approach in Estonia. Yes, parts of government can see parts of my data, but I see when they do, and I can hold them to account as well. So this is just a small insight from uh, Estonia into uh, what's been happening so far and also what we're dealing with today and what the challenges are. And I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion uh, on everything about good tech and what it can do for the world. Thank you, Florian. Um, that was really interesting. I think I'm going to move to Estonia. I could jump with a reminder. About You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> of booking is, is, is absolutely fascinating, and that's what tech you know for good is all about is making people's lives easier and, and better um so for this empath panel we've got um three great um, speakers which is introduced now um we've got dr jackie mulligan who is a um, founder and chief exec of shop appy and she is helping the high street thrive and survive <laughs> Uh, we also have Nick Hill, who is founder of um, GovShare, and he has been working with the government on building better communities and networks through using technology as an enabler. And finally, we've got um, Gemma McCall, who is co-founder and chief, chief exec of Culture Shift. It's an impact software development business founded in 2018 and already doing some um, great things in the three, four years since um, you launched. So uh, welcome, um, guys, to our uh, final session of the day and, and looking at um, tech for good. It's a phrase that's been sort of thrown about quite recently, but technology has been helping people's lives to make it better for quite some time now. And um, I think the pandemic, if it's done one thing, is you know making sure that people are thinking about how tech can improve their lives and how the tech can, you know, change you know communities and um you know give them more insight as to their next steps so um i'm going to just quickly ask everyone if you can tell a bit our audience a bit more about themselves and you know one of your favorite maybe examples of how technology has helped to improve society and i'll start off with you and jackie uh, yeah, so my name is Jackie Mulligan and I'm the founder of shophappy.com. I started Shophappy in 2016 to help my own local high street and make it easier for people like me to shop local uh, because when we shop local we're happier and when we live in places we feel happier and I felt the world was getting too dominated by one particular online giant and that was hitting our high streets and our communities so we wanted to find a local alternative and it's grown significantly so now we're in over 100 towns and cities across the UK and uh, we allow people to get convenience with a local conscience. And a lot of that is around planet, environment, people, places. So we always say happy people, happy places, happy planet. So my uh, interest in the tech for good side is also been latterly much more around the climate. And there's just even small initiatives. So one of the things that we suffer from in the UK right now is that raw sewage is being poured into our oceans and our rivers regularly and uh, there's a now a, a surface against sewage created a brilliant app that creates that transparency so that you get an alert and it will show you uh, what's happening it will get, encourage you to write to the your mp it will encourage you to sign petitions and so i think it's creating a whole level of trans uh, visibility of bad behavior and catalyzing activism to address it in uh, the normal way of speaking to politicians about it asking for debates 
uh, because it does affect communities. So anything that does that, I think, is a good thing. And things around food waste that I've seen have been amazing as well. So there's a the Olio app that allows people to use food waste. So I think climate has really risen up the agenda. And I'm impressed by the initiatives I'm seeing that coming out of that. <laughs> That's Jackie. Um, Nick, I'll just go to you. Yeah, thank you. Just um, I'm having a few problems with my mute, unmute. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I predominantly work um, with local government and the public sector. Um, and obviously, we've uh, we've seen that sector have to, having to rise to the challenge because, um, you know, over the last sort of uh, up to 15 years, uh, they've been trying to work flexibly and remotely uh, with the technology always been there uh, um, and never been allowed to because of trust and cultural issues. Um, and yet in a crisis, uh, because there's no option, all of a sudden en masse, um, local authority, there's local authorities up and down the country that are, in fact, not just local authorities, housing associations, and obviously other other vertical markets as well. But we've seen a we've seen um, an incredible um, increase and in take up of the use of technology because of the pandemic. Um, technologies that I've seen recently, um, well, it, there's, I mean, there's so many uses of and i think sometimes there are apps and there are solutions that are actually created for the sole purpose of of creating social good so it's um, this street link which is a homeless app um which uses gps um you know you see someone on the street you actually go to the street link app um, you type in your coordinates you say where you are you can even take a picture of them if they allow you to just in case they're known to that particular area it will identify hostels it will identify obviously other third party stakeholders possibly like uh, drug dependency units and that sort of thing and that's a great app but actually it's a sticking plaster on something on a, on a bigger issue and, and I think sometimes it's interesting when we look at tech for good um, actually we shouldn't be creating apps supporting homeless people that are on the street we should be creating technology that actually further behind actually reduces and stops people from becoming homeless. Um, but the other interesting thing also, I think, you know, I'm a, I've become a parish councillor during the pandemic, um, uh, more, more as a hobby. Um, but during that, so during the pandemic, um, a Facebook group was created overnight, uh, with which in five days had over a thousand um, volunteers. So as soon as a request, for medicine or shopping went on to this, basically a group, a Facebook group. Within half an hour, it'd been delivered. Now, you know, Facebook gets a lot, gets a very bad rep sometimes. But had that, had that, had Facebook not been there, I'm sure we should have, we could have coordinated that sort of response, but it would have taken a lot longer. Mm. But that's just an, I think, then an innovative use of an existing piece of technology, which mm. I think is a different, a different thing. I mean, I could back on about loads. I mean, it's all sorts, isn't there? Um, yeah. It's all that sort of stuff, but I'll I'll let you move on to Gemma now. Yeah, thanks, Nick. And, uh, Gemma. Hi, so um, I'm Gemma McCall, and I'm uh, CEO and co-founder of Culture Shift. Um, and as Shaleen said, uh, we're a tech for good um, business that was founded in 2018. Um, and our tech allows anyone who has experienced or witnessed any kind of bullying or harassment um, to speak up and report it so that they can get support for what they've been through. It allows the licensing organisation to understand any problem areas so that they can take a proactive and preventative approach to it happening again, not just get better at dealing with the people um, and supporting the people who have experienced that behaviour. Um, I There is a lot of, you know, uh, there's, so, there's so much tech and there are some really like interesting um, things that are coming out. I was going to say um, Olio as well, Jackie, because that's just, um, I only discovered that the other day and it, it blew my mind that it existed. It's such a good idea in this. I don't like just to say what it is. Um, it's a app. If you've, um, you know, had a um, takeaway or a, um, you know, a, an exhibition or something like that, where you've had like a big buffet and instead of, throwing the food away um, you can say right we've got this food um, you know like and we're at this location and um, then people can come and get get it get food so that it's not wasted and that's just an incredible 
use of technology to solve the issue uh, or you know help the issue of food poverty but to Nick's point it's the same sort of thing you know it's a it's a sticking plaster over a, a huge societal problem um the other um use of tech that I like is the the way that it is opening up the discussion and removing the stigma in my opinion around mental health concerns um and that's kind of you know down to the fact that that more and more of these apps are um are coming to the um, market but also the kind of accessible and i don't mean accessible in the in the way of accessibility i mean the removal of the stigma around talking about our mental health and normalizing that conversation um and i i think the, the more of that we can have the better i suppose the um, pand pandemic has changed people's attitudes towards mental health and towards talking about stuff and i think it's given you know it's, an, it's been a right opportunity for tech you know, people in tech to do something about it whether that is you know people on a Facebook group trying to encourage, you know, people to come together and, and, and share resources. But would you say the pandemic has definitely shifted that conversation and shifted people's um, priorities? Um, I don't know whether it's shifted it enough. I think um, one of the things I'm slightly concerned about is that um, the pandemic you know, it, like, hopefully, <laughs> it's not going to be here forever. You know, we're currently, you know, able to, you know, live a, a normalish life. Um, and I'm a little bit concerned that that um, is going to go, uh, because it was something that kind of happened because of a needs must situation for 18 or so months. And then it, the, the, the focus on it goes away. And that would be a, a crying shame for that to happen. You know, we need to like learn more this period of time and build on it and continue with it in in my opinion yeah what about yourself Nick? do you think you know things have changed or there's, there's still there's still a lot of work to do we all we all know that i think we're heading in the right direction um well well certainly for my you know in my own market a local government um i mean i've been running a lot of virtual of virtual events and um you know, for a lot of people and a lot of organisations, the genie is out of the bottle. Some local authorities are already trying to put it back in, but they're in a minority. Um, I, I agree with, I agreed, uh, with Gemma, actually. Um, I think it, it's quite interesting that certainly the pandemic that I've experienced, certainly with regards to community, in my own community, it has very much sort of shown me what an amazing community I live in. However, because that community, um, certain parts of that community haven't been able to get together um, for uh, big community events. We're, we're a community of tribes at the moment. So whilst we all live in the same area, um, it has become quite tribal. I, I personally um, think that my own sort of business of in-person events, I used to run in-person events up until last March. I'd never run a, I'd never run a webinar. I always shied away from them. But now my entire business is 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 predicated on virtual events, and I'm a, a Zoom public sector partner and that sort of thing. Um, but I'm I'm absolutely desperate to get out to, for in-person events again. There will be, I think, um, a hybrid. There'll be a hybrid sort of um, events market uh, and industry that is created. Um, but even the most introvert of social, you know, of human beings requires that social interaction. Um, but tech, tech obviously has, has, has definitely made sure that we all keep on functioning. And, and, and that is good. So as far as this session goes, you know, hooray for tech. But I still think, you know, and, and I don't want to keep going on about it. It's, it, it. I'll just tell this really quick story. I went to an event about six, seven years ago, an in-person event where I met somebody that I'd known through the previous 15 years. So I've been doing this for 22 years at the sort of looking at the modernizing government agenda. Uh, and he, he was a guy that worked in a lot of local authorities around the Northwest and had set up a consultancy. And he said that he couldn't believe, and he, there was a couple of expletives, but he couldn't believe that we were still discussing and talking about paying parking tickets online 
when there was a poor distribution of wealth in this country, there was homelessness, there were food banks. And, you know, it's, I guess it's, it's that sort of thing when, you know, when you're talking to people and people go, oh no, you know, um, our organization, they just, you know, we're low code and robotics and auto automation technology is really big in local government at the moment, or well, they should be, uh, but people are reticent and there's a, there's a big cultural issue. But, I mean, that, that shouldn't be, you know, I think it's about innovative thinking. It's not about the tech. It's about what you do with the tech. Mm -hmm. uh, and all this sort of tech for good is is, is about the innovation of, of, of doing things differently. Yeah. It's a bit like what Florian was talking about, what they're doing in Estonia. I was, yeah. just, I was just amazed Absolutely. at you know, connecting Absolutely. it all together. Absolutely. Just quickly before we move to Jeff, we, there's uh, Swindon Borough Council just won an award for a robotic process automation. So automation of processes um, project they've done around free school meals, um, which means that uh, they can speed up the time it takes for somebody to apply and, and you know, they're at proof of eligibility, et cetera, et cetera. Free school meals is a really is a really difficult service. It, there's a lot of stigma attached to it. Um, and there's a lot of problems around deprivation and education and that sort of thing. They, they've managed to automate that, but actually if people, someone like the Department for Work and Pensions, a bit like Florian was saying, you know, Department of Work and Pensions have all the information required to identify who it is is on a certain level of benefits. And if they were to link into something like what Swindon has built, nobody would ever need to apply for free school meals ever again. You would just be entitled to it and you would just get it straight away. And that's why when, when I say, you know, and, they, and Swindon have a, uh, are speaking to DWP, but that's the sort of thinking. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's actually then making it frictionless, but actually thinking about, you know, why is it, what makes this difficult? And it's not just about technology, it's, it's about people and it's about culture. And being more sympathetic to people, for sure. Yeah, when tech work, it works really well. When I say about pandemic, I was, I was thinking more about the vaccine and the rollout of the vaccine, and we probably couldn't have done it without the tech enabling that rollout. And I think tech for good. That's what I was sort of thinking about how how that helped us to get to where we are, where you know, seventy percent of the population are now double that. So, yeah, um, Jackie, um, obviously your um business it's, it's it's you know it's 100 towns across across the uk have you seen the demand for that increase over the last year because of what's happening to the high street at the moment and with online shopping etc yeah i mean when we saw the beginning of lockdown suddenly uh, supermarkets didn't have toilet roll and our corner shop jumped to it because local shops had uh, supplies and things like that so there was a kind of shift towards oh what well, i'll have to go to my high street people who were commuting were suddenly uh, living in their own town and seeming to care much more about that community rather than walking past shops to get the train and walking back when the shops were closed there was much more consciousness of it and there's a whole I think there's a whole culture in the UK of the, the underdog and it felt very much that the independents particularly those in what the government deemed as non-essential which has to be the worst term you could ever uh, bestow on any business um, when they started to label those businesses and stop them trading yet supermarkets were able to I think that there was a little bit of a, uh, a pushback. There are now uh, more groups than ever, you know, boycott Amazon, et cetera. And I welcome it because uh, we have to think about our actions. We have to think about our behavior and how it impacts where we live, it, how it impacts on uh, how safe we feel in our community. Speak to any uh, woman in particular, because, uh, you know, we've seen an increase in violence against women uh, walking down a, a street with boarded up shops not a particularly good experience. So I think that technology can do a lot around helping people join the dots. And yeah, of course, we saw a take up of what was happening and people wanting to have the visibility of the high street and remind mm -hmm. themselves it's there. What I wanted to just go back to as well is things like Zoom and video conferencing, that's revolutionized um, our business. So we, we scaled so dramatically from March. I mean, March, we we're in 30 towns. So we've now got a team and the team have never met in person um we've all met through uh, video conferencing uh, but what we were really conscious of is using the technology not to be a dull kind of let's have another meeting when it could have mm -hmm. been an email but actually creating more engagement events and I think we we're much more conscious of our mental health and well-being as a team because we know we're all working remotely and the other thing that I really hope stays 
long term is that the, these video, you always think of video conferencing. I was like you, I came from the events industry, Nick, and I really didn't like the idea of video conferencing. Because, hey, when you go to a live event, you see the whole person. You don't. You see a, tra- you see a person performing a role in front of you. Oh, is this a person worth t- talking to? Can I network with them? Oh, I'll shake their hand then, because they've got a lanyard that tells me what they do, which is a tiny part. But when we were in video conferencing, you see what people have got behind them. The kid interrupts them. They've got a cat going past the screen. You have a deeper conversation. So weirdly, technology, I think, has made it more personal and brought things closer together. So I just hope we can hang on to some of that. And we're not past COVID. The the vaccine program is great. But let's not forget the booster program is terrible, actually. And we are in the, at this point, the government having to think of plan B. So we are no way out of the water right now. Mm-hmm. And there's a great danger in us thinking we are. Mm-hmm. And just going back to, to about the Zoom and um, see people um, online, I feel like I've seen a lot more people of the past year than I would have done face to face. Yeah, no, I see more of my mum's forehead than I like to think about, really, um, at, over the last 18 months. But that the other the other point around this whole thing around technology and data that's great in East, Estonia, I have a certain resistance, I have to say, a very great worry about data uh, and the use of data and how it can fall into the wrong hands or be used for malicious purposes. So I do have a little bit of a concern. But, yeah, there there is, um, you know, this whole understanding of each other we've all been through a shared experience we've all like there's one common thing that we've all had which is our frailty as human beings and we should be galvanizing that part but in fact we we kind of it feels like it's getting more tribal I think there's a whole agenda around culture wars which isn't helping us at the moment yeah I think yeah all all text is is good and, and and there's bad and it brings people together and yeah can divide people as well um so just moving on to um, Gemma, so you, you, know, you launched your business in 2018 and in the last year or so, I mean, you guys have grown very quickly. You've got funding to take your technology to more universities, more organisations. Just tell us a little bit more about the kind of work that you are doing with this, you know, with the Me Too campaign, for example, you know, you know women's um, safety and well, not just women, it's men as well, isn't it? It's you know paramount more than um, ever before, and you know, it's opened up the whole conversation all over again. And um, yeah, just tell us a bit more about the kind of work that you are doing, and you know where you see your technology um, moving. Yeah, um, you know when we first um, started, which was back um, when we collaborated with the University of Manchester, like which predates actually um, Culture Shift back in 2016. Um, it was to take a very um, difficult process for survivors um, and make it much easier to access so that we were removing barriers to reporting. So back at that time, if someone had experienced something, they would have to walk into an office, ask for a form, go out of the office, fill out that form, come back in and say, hi, can you help me please? And this, you know, when you're in the mindset of a of a survivor or someone that you know has experienced something traumatic there are so many points along the way um to to decide actually do you know what this is too difficult i'm not going to do this not least the fact that you you know are walking into an office and saying hello i need help um so you know initially when we started out we wanted to take the um process online so that it was available at a time and place where someone felt safe to report the situation that they'd experienced um and also uh, in some cases uh decide to remain anonymous um and that has you know transformed things from a reporting point of view because a couple of really interesting things have happened um one of the sort of trends that sounds weird but I'll I'll I'll, I'll give the point anyway that sort of excites me the most is the fact that someone will initially report anonymously and then go on to make, uh, put their name to that report a little while later. And I think that um, 
that is an understanding that we didn't have when we first developed the system, but really will help um, understand the mindset of someone who's been through trauma and understand the survivor's journey to, to get from kind of A to B, if you like, and access support for what they've experienced, which is like the most important thing. But I think as, as, as well on the flip side, um, for an organisation that acknowledges that they have a problem or acknowledges that this is a societal problem actually I should say not that not an individual organization problem um they're grappling with individual cases and either doing like handling those individual cases better or not really handling them very well in which case the person would leave the organization or remove themselves from from education which is an absolute crying shame it's one of the things that um hurts my brain the most when I think about people who have you know could have potentially gone on to you know discover new covid vaccines or whatever it may be the fact that they've left education because of something that they experienced hurts my brain like i say but the organization get better maybe at handling the individual cases but they need to take a preventative and a proactive approach so it stops happening in the first place and they can shift that culture so those problems aren't able to exist and and thrive in the first place um, so uh, like working with organizations to understand and ha- you know giving them a sort of 24 7 listening post if you like which is what our system is but then layering up that data and sort of Florian kind of was was speaking about this a little bit earlier connecting things right so an organization will put loads of money behind um, you know the diverse recruitment agenda right on one hand then they'll but then they'll, the attrition rates will be high what's happening there because piling money into um, recruiting more diversely is a fantastic and admirable thing and, and things something that's organizations sh- that should be doing but then if the culture that exists within the organization isn't a welcoming one then people will leave so there's work to do all the way along the line you can't just pour money into this bit and hope that the, that that bit works you've got to understand what people's experiences are and layer up that data to get a better understanding of, of what's happening. Um, you know, both um, Joanne and Jackie and um, your platforms, you know, they've been created specifically for their purposes. But um, I guess um, it go, goes back to, you know, what Nick was saying earlier, um, is there no, there's not enough maybe preventative measures that tech's playing a role in, stuff that's happening in Estonia already that we're not, um, <laughs> doing here um are enough big organizations thinking about the sort of tech for good aspect that they could be doing rather than just thinking about you know selling more shoes online or dresses online and not <laughs> thinking about the other social aspect of it is, is there more that could be done and you know if so how do they do that if you well i i mean one of the things is every organization is full of people and uh, most people have a consciousness about the environment more of us that never care about the environment or care about the social impacts so um organizations need to listen to their because people leave when they don't believe in the leadership or they don't believe in the values and that isn't generational it's across generational um so i think that's one thing is understand there isn't a big corporate there's a lot of people behind a big corporate um but there is there is a need for us to interrogate if technology is doing something bad um, and ha- to what extent is is technology contributing to negative things? I think they did an analysis about self-image and awareness, and mental health, and looked at all social media in relation to that. Mm-hmm. And it really worries me there doesn't seem to be ethical safeguards at all in anybody introducing that or interrogating that or being answerable to that. I don't personally believe that the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley have the best interests, societal best interests at heart. And as soon as you have investors involved that are looking at it in a different way, it might change it, even if it started with the right heart. So I think there's a, a whole thing around, uh, you know, more environmental, social impact investing uh, that's needed uh, because it, it's the businesses with purpose that probably have the longest and more sustainable uh, route. And it's the businesses that are needing to retrofit. When you talk to the fashion industry, they're so conscious at the moment about what they're doing and how can they make it better. But it's so difficult. Mm-hmm. So there's some, you know, the visibility of the supply chain, all of that is just impossible. And they can't claim things. They should be using the hive mind. They should be asking people 
to come up with the solutions and being honest about the problems they're facing. Yeah, you want clothes delivered to your door. Don't expect it not to be wrapped in plastic. Either stop doing that or or come up with a solution that makes it easier and better. Mm -hmm. We've all been forced to do that now, haven't they? But um, yes, it's not come from like the heart, I suppose. <laughs> well, part of it is the customer push, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the visibility, more of us know about what's going on. And it's how much we can tolerate uh, that and doing things that aren't aligned with our values. Um, and we apparently can tolerate quite a lot of go going against our values in support of convenience. But I don't mm. think we can continue to do that when COP26 happens. We are at a tipping point. We really do need to change our behaviours. Yeah. Do you feel the conversation is changing, though? People are talking about ESG more. Um, businesses are now beginning to look at their sort of priorities around that, what they can do. Um, this is not a conversation they were having five years ago. It's a conversation they are beginning to have. Although, I think it's more urgent, isn't it? It's yeah. a more urgent and pressing problem. But uh, it is the rationale for it is what we've got to interrogate. Is it is it really meaningful? Or is it we have to do this now because now we're going for council contracts and they ask us to put social value in? Hey, what have we done for social value? Anyone? Oh, yeah, yeah that's something I really, really worried about. Can't, worry about, can't be like, like that. Yeah, like, is it just a tick box exercise? Mm. Um, or are the people that, that, that have the responsibility for driving, uh, or uh, are, driving is a nice word actually, for tick boxing the ESG agenda and making sure that it's like a couple of pages in the annual report, um, do they care about it? Is there enough buy-in across from the senior um, level of the organisation or is it still just seen as a tick box exercise? Because in, until it's not, until it's seen as a complete core to the success of our business um like it you know it's just surface level so nick were you going to say something then well i just think you know you've got to remember also that tech obviously is also contributing quite you are know, greatly to the, the co2 emissions and that sort of thing i can't remember the exponential amount of terabytes of data each day that is um that, that is being stored um but you know again there, there needs to be more advances in that but i just think it's quite i think i think it's quite interesting um what both jackie and jen were talking about before i just i was talking to um a kid in our or a child in our local park who'd been having some problems with bullying um and what's interesting now is you know in our in my day bullying happened at school but you had a bit of a reprieve a bit of a rest when you went home and you could you know go and tell your mom have a cry but now it's 24-7, it's relentless, it's, you know, via every channel, it's omni-channel bullying. Um, and I think a, a lot of this, a lot of the sort of stuff that, um, you know, Jackie was talking about, you know, social values and that sort of thing, and and, and holding tech platforms and social media platforms to account, I think that needs to be done. But it, it, at the same time, you know, there isn't enough happening in education around how tech is changing the way that we sort of, you know that we live with each other mm. um and it shouldn't it shouldn't happen it shouldn't need to happen to be fair but it does need to happen because mm. um you know when i was i'm certainly so i was a kid of the 70s and i i can't remember and i, I could be proven wrong but i can't remember in the news a child hanging themselves because of bullying because of relentless bullying but i see that you hear more you hear more and more of that and that, that really, you know, that angers me, that it can get to that. Um, but I guess we shouldn't really end on it, you know, and it is a very a sad part. Um, but, you know, tech's brilliant and, and tech is brilliant. And I tell you what, there's some great tech disruption going on in the Northwest. The very good, I'm going to mention now, a, a friend of mine who used to run a, um, an agency um, in Manchester called Great Friday. He's a guy called Matt Farrer. He's now got a company called Love Buy um and they're doing a lot around uh, nudge theory and wearable tech um around type 1 diabetes uh and with adolescents and that sort of thing so there's amazing stuff going on but i mean i think disruption isn't about the tech it's about the people's ideas and i don't keep banging on about that but it's you know the, the tech you could have the most innovative innovative tech in the world you know but it's the person that thinks about it they can give it to somebody that hasn't got a clue and they won't do anything with it but it's um and ideas are good you know and everyone can have ideas 
Might have one for make loads of tech, but yeah, it's um, it's, been, it's an interesting it's an interesting topic. It's not one that really you can just have in forty five minutes. No, no, definitely. There's, there's a lot to um, go out here, and we'll, yeah. we'll actually come to the end of this session. And as Nick said, um, let's uh, leave this on you know, a high note because tech is doing amazing things, and you know we wouldn't be here doing this if it wasn't for the good tech available out there. So uh, thank you for your um, time um, today, Gemma, Jackie, and, and, and Nick. Um, this is the um, end of our, uh, so this is our last session um, for today. I hope you guys um, enjoyed um, the sessions. Um, as Jürgen Mayer, a keynote um, speaker, said earlier today, um, seize the day and um, be a leader in your industry, industry be the um, disruptor and you know the timing couldn't be um, better. Um, I just want to say thank you to our headline sponsors as well, um, Clarion, Deloitte, um, UK Fast and Cuba. Also thanks goes to Sticky Eyes and Northern Powerhouse Investment Fund, WeLink, Curve Block, Ribble and um, Netsers. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed the day. Please look out um, for our um, Tech and um, our uh, Disruptors North and um, features are gone to um, the Business Desk website um, tomorrow. Thank you and um, goodbye.